Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draws are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. Remember, when you become a member of GoHunt.com forward slash insider, you're going to get a $50 gift card to GoHunt gear shop. What's in the gear shop? The best gear that you can buy for hunting the West. All in all, if you're hunting out West in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is Bruce Hutchins, your host and the executive producer. We're heading out to Michigan today. And we're going to visit with the owner of Complete Deer Management, Casey Theron. Casey, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bruce. Glad to be here. Well, let's start right off and, and tell people what Complete Deer Management is all about. Then we're going to sort of kind of unpack that over the next 30, 40 minutes. Sure. Complete Deer Management is um, a business about managing hunting properties for deer. And I called it complete because I want to try to hit every aspect that the client could possibly need to manage their property for deer from, you know, everything, putting up blinds to putting in food plots, everything. I try to instill a timber stand improvements and everything that they need. So, um, and, and even consulting, just, you know, coming out and giving an extra couple of pair of eye on it and getting, and going out and giving suggestions. So. That's kind of the premises, you know, everything, everything there is to deal with the, the hunt property, everything, the goals and objectives that the client needs. Now, how small a parcel will you go down to? Well, any size, really. Um, I, I haven't seen too many one acre or two acre deals. However, I have talked to a few guys that hunt on one acre or, or, or less. I used to own and hunt on five acres. Um, where my business, my old businesses was located. And um, I shot does off it. I could get them in there and, and shoot does. Uh, bucks were a little different story. But um, so, yeah, and especially here where I am in, in central Michigan, mid-Michigan area, there are a number of parcels that are, you know, as deer, in the deer world, smaller, you would say. You know, when you look at, you know, um, one acre, I know guys that that's what they hunt in suburbia. Uh, and they do real well because the whole thing's a funnel. The whole thing's a transition zone. The whole thing's a staging zone. It's everything in in one place. You got an interstate on one side and a house on the other side. So, you know, there's a lot of deer there, no question. But it's just you have to figure it out. Little different, uh, little different format. That's for sure. And it's hard putting uh, uh, food plots in, you know, next to the fence on the and on the interstate. That's for sure. So when, yeah, when I haven't it, done that. Yet. I, well, I it's possible. It. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's possible. possible. It's possible in Michigan. That's that's for sure. So, you know, let's talk about your beginning and how you're a, a quote unquote an expert in, you know, landscaping for for whitetails. Yeah, so I've been hunting since I've been twelve or thirteen years old. So I've always been a hunter. Um, my mentor um, wasn't my dad, but it was a, a ex a brother in law of mine got me into it. Um, if it wasn't for him, I don't know if I if I would ever would have done it. Really, um, always was interested. My grandma, uh, when I was you know young and BB gun age, um, I remember she used to tell me about hunting. And of course, back in that them days, they hunted for food a lot. So I shot my first rabbit. She cleaned it, showed me how to clean it, and cooked it up for me, and we ate it. And and then when I 
got my bow and shot my first deer. I think I was 12 or 13, and that was it for me. So I've been hunting, you know, for 27 years or so, but never got into the managing side very much. Um, here in Michigan, the heavy tradition of going out and getting a buck, and, um, and deer camp is big and still is. Um, it's, it's coming around to more managing as you get uh, more and more people and, and less places to hunt. Um, so when I started this, I've always kind of put in food plots. I was, my background is horticulture, so I have a horticulture degree. So I went from putting in residential and commercial landscapes, not for deer, putting in plants that deer don't eat or less preferred, to getting plants and, and the deer do eat. And um, once I joined the Quality Deer Management Association, QDMA, um, I'm like, why wasn't I in this forever? <laughs> why wasn't I in this from the very beginning? It was something hit me over the head and go, man, I, uh, what was I doing? I just kind of kicked myself in the rear for not being involved sooner, understanding more about the deer and the deer biology. And um, this is like, man, I, I got to figure out a way to do this. Um, and luckily, uh, I've been able to do this for about six years full time. I kind of transitioned from the old business putting in food plots. Back in the 2008-7 here in Michigan, they had a CWD um, in, a, in an enclosure. And then, so they banned baiting for three years. So the food plot, really, everybody was into food plots. Um, and so I started getting into it a, mo a lot more at that time, really wasn't charging people. And then seeing that there was a little bit of a niche there to make a little bit of money. And I kind of gets me in the door and then I can, a lot of the clients, you know, it's coming around to consulting and, and the, the, the bigger names that are doing it are out, are still out there and, and doing well. And so I'm just kind of going in the back door and working my way up. So I'm still learning myself, but I got a good base with the QDMA, Quality Deer Management Association, and my horticulture background and wildlife forestry conservation. So, yeah, it's a, there's a lot to it, and there's always a lot to learn. Yeah, I understand from your bio that uh, you're a deer steward with uh, QDMA. What's that all about? So the, the QDMA has um, so much information to learn the biology and and about deer. Um, and they offer a deer steward class. Um, it's in their, their kind of their uh, acronym REACH, Research, Educate, Advocate, Certify, and Hunt. So they have certifications that you can go and Learn right from the QDMA, um, the CEO from, you know, uh, Brian Murphy and Kip Adams and, and Matt Ross and all those, you know, Joe Hamilton, the founder, he's always there. And then they bring in professors that they work with from different universities. And you sit right down with them and learn from them. Um, PowerPoint presentations. So there's, I think there's three, three levels, Dear Steward One, and I, um, it's all about Pretty much classroom work. I think they have an online. Uh, you can do online now. Uh, when I went, I went to Missouri and spent the weekend. And just it's a it's a deer school overload. Um, I mean, your brain just is working the whole time, and just a lot of aha moments and and stuff like that. When you when you learn all the biology and all this, uh, what why deer do what they do. Um, and then the, the deer steward two is more of a hands-on. That one was luckily I was in, it was in Michigan that year. And um, cause I think they only have two or three a year. And so you get to go down and walk around the woods and, and learn about native habitat and what deer eat and how deer act and travel and breed and all that stuff. Um, and different techniques of soil and food plots and all that. And they kind of teach you how to read maps and, you know, follow how follow the deer trails and follow. How, try to be be try to become a better hunter of them. There's there's a three levels, and I'm almost on my level three. There's a deer steward three, and that's pretty much um, work on your own. Um, they they kind of leave it to you. There's an application process, and you do all these different things for you know the, the requirements of the application, and you can become a deer steward three, which is their highest level right now. And that's uh, very good if you're a deer hunter. I rec recommend it to every deer hunter out there. And, folks, if you haven't ever taken any time, um, get the QDMA 
deer report. If you do nothing else, just get that, and it'll show you the depth of uh, of what QDMA does in the research. Yes, I'm a proponent of QDMA, and there's some great people out there, and, and Casey mentioned them. But the biggest thing, and I'm taking the class class one uh, this year, and I've only been hunting whitetails for 51, but uh, and talking with Kip and some of the other people there, you know, it'll give me insights. So when I'm talking to my guests on my podcast, I'll be able to ask them questions that I can't ask right now. And because what I found, especially in whitetail hunting, um, you'll never know everything. Yeah, you know that John Stan has produced a buck for 21 years. Okay, why? Actually, that's self that question. And I would challenge anybody to ask themselves that question. Why has John Stan produced a buck? Forget about those, just a buck every year for blank years. And there's a reason for that. And so if you go back and check everything and backtrack the deer and find out his movements, blah, 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 uh, you're going to be astounded to what that, that deer will tell you. And pe- we, don't, we don't do that. I don't do that enough. And so, you know, uh, I'm, I'm ranting about QDMA, but, uh, you know, it, it's probably going to be the best investment that they do have uh, right now openings in the online course. Uh, they just opened it up. Matt Ross is in charge of that. So get a hold of them. Say, hey, I, I kind of sort of like to be part of that because uh, you're going to do the online course at home. Uh, you know, football season's over. Uh, yeah, shed season started, but, um, you know, there still might be some snow and stuff. And, you know, couple of months you can knock that sucker out so th- that's my that's my uh that's my uh shout out promo for quality deer management and their deer steward program so let's go back let's go back to casey and and talk about you know uh, how you so i call you up i got a 40 acre plot and it's little farmland little woodland little swamp and i got a couple roads around it and my neighbors uh, are browning down, and I want to suck deer onto my property, so I'll get a chance to get a mature buck. So what do I do? So usually what I do is um, talk to the a potential client on the phone for, you know, sometimes it's it's averages about an hour we're on the phone. I have a, a list, a number of questions to ask them. Um, if they're calling me already, they're, they're already thinking about improving their land. So I kind of have an idea, yes, um, they want to do something to help themselves be, you know, be better, be successful at deer hunting anyway. But that it could be all levels. You know, it could be, um, hey, I want to shoot quality bucks all the time, or I want to shoot trophy bucks all the time. Now, I'm at a level of probably... You know, I can't guarantee, or well, I don't know who can, but um, hey, I can get you shooting a 130-inch class deer in three years. Well, I can't, I can't say that. I can't even say for sure that you know that you're even going to see them or have them. However, what I can do is look, you know, again, list of list of questions that I ask them, um, and of course, neighbors. On 40 acres, if that's your example, average size of a uh, average home range of a deer, 640 acres. That's um, knowledge through the QDMA's research that they've done. So some deer are lower, some deer are, are higher acreage. Um, so we know that a lot of deer are coming through your property, and we cannot control all of them. So we just try to. If, the, if the, your neighbors are, you know, there's a bunch of shooting out of there, first thing I would ask them to do is reach out to your neighbors. Reach out to your neighbors and, and have a conversation with them and see what they're doing. And, of course, a conversation has to be, in the beginning, has to be um, light and uh, get to know them a little bit. You know, the more they know you, the better it is that maybe you can work together. And... Um, I'm sure you, you, I'm sure Bruce, you've heard of the deer cooperatives and neighbors working together. Um, you know, you can start talking about that and, and seeing what, how they do it. And one good thing is to kind of teach them the benefits of, you know, let's say you do want to shoot some quality deer. And, and for me and a lot of my clients, it's two and a half years old or older bucks. Uh, in my area where I hunt, I have 20 acres. 
So I'm pretty much in the um, in line with that example you gave me. So I reached out to my neighbors to see what they're doing. And they shoot a lot of yearling bucks. And um, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I can't get upset with it. As I've been up. I've been upset with it before. There's just it's not it's not worth the time and effort to do that. I can't control it. So let that go and just kind of try to help him out, maybe give him a QDMA uh, uh, membership or a pamphlet that says the benefits of letting them yearlings go and then the benefits of having um, the correct amount of deer on the land and, and just try to help him out. So that's the kind of the start. Obviously, we both know that a lot more to it. There's a property visit involved. Um, we see what the deer are doing on the land, see what the land has. Um, and deer need a diverse habitat. So if the land has something, we try to either improve on it and then give the land something that it doesn't have. Around here in Michigan, a lot of the native vegetation isn't around because of the um, a lot of the, it gets deer browsed heavily. We have a lot of deer numbers. So we try to timber stand improvement. Usually first, we look at the native habitat, get rid of the, the less desired species like ferns and, and um, go, well, uh, let's see, birds. And, and I was going to give you, I was going to give you plants that they do eat, but uh, that's pretty much a, 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 a good one. But there's thistle and there's lots of things. Usually it, grasses, you know, it's, it's a low preferred food. So we got to get rid of those things, promote what deer do eat. And you'll see deer usually. And then we got to get those deer in a hunting position so we can travel them around your property, get them on your property during daylight so you can actually see them and, and shoot them. And so it, it's one of those things where the landowner has to commit. It's almost, you know, you, you do a bunch of work at first, usually, and then it's always something, there's always something to do, to do on the property, probably as long as you own it. What about hinge cutting? A lot of people I just saw Land and Legacy, uh, Matt Dye put something up on hinge cutting, what it is and what it isn't. And, um, you know, a lot of people use it for create bedding. Other people use it to create um, trails. And so the deer won't go X, they'll go Y. So what's your thought on hinge cutting, even on 40 acres? I think it's a very valuable tool. It's um, It's one of those things where, you know, a mechanic, if you go into a mechanic shop or a, or a doctor's office or whatever, they have a big old toolbox and almost every tool you can imagine in there to, to rebuild a car or whatever. Same thing here. We need as many different tools in our toolbox, and hinge cutting is definitely one of them. Um, I'm actually doing, I, I'm actually hinge cutting on my property right now. There's a lot of felling, too, so I just fell some trees down, create some daylight, which will create the new early growth to come in and bush it up, and, and it's all food, too. Um, you know, here in Michigan, it's really popular, um, and I actually, you know, it doesn't look pretty, and if uh, if some of the guys, if you're in a hunt club or, or maybe even in your spouse, and you go out there and create a mess, you know, it's, you got to look at it through the deer's eyes. Deer see that and go, man, that's beautiful. And we, you know, sometimes look at it and go, that's ugly. It's a mess. I don't like walking through it. However, it's very, very good to do that stuff for blocking and access and food and bedding, like you said. So it's one of those tools. I think you can do too much of it. Um, and then it, it's kind of dangerous. So you, you got to be very, very careful doing it. Um, but as soon as you knock a tree down, especially like here in the winter, I was out last weekend starting my, I'm, I'm doing it right now for access. So I'm building a little two foot trail for me to walk alongside my property line to get to the back of my property. Being 20 acres, I, I, it's really, I gotta, to get those older bucks in here, two, three year old, they, they gotta make sure, you got to make a think that you're not hunting them. So it's, it's pretty difficult. And, um, but that within two hours, I had deer in there eating what I cut down, which was popple, maple, some black cherry, stuff like that. Um, so it, it's nice to talk to somebody. If you do get into hinge cutting, that's done it before. So to give you some tips, if it's a maple, 
Um, sometimes they're dangerous and they'll barber tear and what they call come kind of come back on you. You kind of got to be careful of the size of tree that you hinge cut. Popple or aspen, they don't hinge cut, so you might as well just cut them off and down. Um, and there's lots of videos out there, lots of good guys out there that on YouTube that have done it. And, and so I use it as a tool. You know, folks, um, there's a lot of tools, but you have to use them in in a series of rotation or, you know, it's just like building a house. Um, you start with a foundation. So building a herd, what is what is our foundation? And then we'll start, uh, you know, putting up the sidewalls and, and the floor and all that stuff. Correct. Um, yeah, that's a good, it's a good foundation. Sometimes if you do something, um, and a lot of guys don't know where to start too. And, and, uh, I, I, I sometimes am that way. So I'll bounce ideas off other guys and, and stuff like that. So the QDMA has quality deer management association has kind of four building blocks, um, of overall deer land management, um, hunter management herd management, herd monitoring, and habitat management. So those are your four building blocks. And then um, each one has their own components, but on your land, you need a good foundation. And a lot of times, I haven't ran into the circumstance yet where I've messed up my foundation. Um, You may have to, you may have done a lot of work. And usually for me, I put in a lot of food plots, usually 50, 60 acres a year for a lot of different people, and that's the first thing they want to do. Well, I know, and you might know, Bruce, that that's probably shouldn't be the first thing you go to when you're talking about deer management. 70% of a deer's diet, the deer's diet, is uh, native vegetation. Um, and we got to make sure that that native vegetation is there so our food plots are successful. If there's high deer numbers, especially right here, we're here, we're, we're at in Michigan. They just destroy food plots. So you got, and it's food plots are one of the most expensive things you can do to your land. One of the most, you know, high, highest quality food you can probably give the deer, um, so to speak. But uh, you can go spend five, six hundred dollars on a on a little plot, and the deer destroy it, and you're you're not very happy that that's happening. So um, it's pretty complex, and hopefully I can help clients utilize their money in a good way and so they're not blowing some and wasting it and and get them a good building block and foundation like you said so we, when we take an overall uh, picture of it and then you know what are some of the you know glaring omissions on anybody's land usually it's um native habitat you know it where i'm at here in michigan um you know michigan had a and still does have high numbers of deer in in pockets, in areas. Um, And, you know, they use a lot of the land. So they eat, they are eating machines, you know, four to six pounds of food on average, and an average size deer. So you take 100, 120 pound deer eating that much dry matter a day. That's a lot. And you have does and you have bucks. So if you have older bucks, um, they're going to eat a lot more or some more anyway. Um, so I think it's native food. And I don't, I think a lot of the, I didn't know this before I joined the quality deer management association. So I'm kind of thinking back. I don't want to talk bad about any, anybody. It's just kind of a lack of knowledge that you don't really understand what a deer eat and how they eat it and how they go about eating it. Um, so I think that's one of the things you'll see a deer. I remember the in some of the PowerPoint presentations that y- you get in the deer steward, you see a deer in the middle of a field, could be a hay field, grass field, whatever. Are they out there eating grass? Probably not. If you walk out there, and I still do it in my backyard here, I'll see a deer eating something, and I'll walk over there and see what it is. And I'll write that down. On January or February 4th, I seen deer eating a woody browse or something. And so I know that's their preferred food right now. And well, I'm kind of getting into more, a little bit more research. And I, I really want to, if I can find the resources to, 
take a snap of that woody browse, put it in a baggie and send it to the lab and see what's in it and see why they're eating that right now. Um, what's in it? Are they getting enough nutrition out of it? Um, the QDM, quality deer management and the QDMA, they're, they're kind of two different things. They are both say quality deer management, but one is association and one is a philosophy. But both philosophies, how the QDMA is deer health and, and, and healthy deer and healthy deer herd. That means what they're eating. That means the number of deer that land can support. Um, if you have too many deer and you don't have enough food, you got a problem. You have under, under, nutri under nutritious deer. I didn't say that right. But you have them just kind of getting by and almost in a constant state of starvation. Um, and what do you do about it? You got to shoot some deer or you got to improve your habitat. I would rather improve, improve my habitat if I can. And, you know, on 20 acres, I can't control my herd. I have to rely on my neighbors and um, working with them and getting deer numbers. I can have an idea, but I can't control it. You know, we've been talking for a half an hour about, you know, deer management and, and making them grow. Um, let's talk about hunting now. You know, that's why we do all this work. There's a few people that do it because they just love to have deer on their, their farm and they don't hunt. And, okay, that's good because they're, they'll help them the neighborhood, you know, the neighboring uh, farms uh, have an opportunity for mature bucks. So the, that's kind of a huge, you know, some people like that create a sanctuary uh, so bucks can grow. Um, nothing wrong with that. But let's talk about Casey and, and your hunting style and, and, you know, on your 20 acres, how, how do you hunt it? Well, I've, I've had to learn. I love hunting. So if I could be, if I had the time and, and, and if I was available to hunt every day, I, I would. Or any time that I could be in a tree stand, that's my favorite archery. Um, just being close to deer is, is exciting. Seeing seeing deer walk by you or watching them do what they do out in the woods. Um, obviously, w during pre-rut and the chasing and all that stuff, all that is just really exciting just to, just to see. Um, so I have to really be careful on this smaller hunting. Uh, my scent control has to be, it should be extreme. I'm not very good at my scent control. So I'm still in the process of learning um, I know that I know of the process and some things that some of the things I need to be doing, um, but I still I'm just still learning and I'm still getting better at. Um, and I spent I spend so much time in the on the habitat and and not on my property on everybody else's property that I don't spend a lot of probably I don't spend enough time for myself to on the hunting side of it. And I'm right now I'm kind of committing myself to doing that a little bit better. So my scent control has to be pretty extreme. Um, and I got to try to get out there on the right days when I think that deer are moving and are back here. Um, so that means high pressure systems, you know, before a rain or before a snowstorm or before a cold front, when more deer are active. Um, the wind, I, 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 I got a low area, so the wind kind of swirls in my back around a swamp that I have. And so I don't look at it a whole lot, but I do look at it, of course. And um, it's just so tough. I want to hunt. I want to be out there. So I might look into other avenues of maybe hunting some state ground, keeping the pressure off my property. I did learn this year that in about a 300-acre section here that I have, I'm probably, uh, there's one and me other bow hunter, and he's 50 yards from me because he's a neighbor. And we're the only bow hunters. So all that other land, that did, you know, if I put any pressure, heavy pressure on it at all, um, the deer have all that other property that they can use and, and feel safe. Not to say I don't get deer here. I do get deer here and I do get some quality bucks here. Um, I just have to pick the right day to hunt them or to be able to shoot them. And, um, and that's it. So it's tough. It is tough. And I do gun hunt. I like gun hunting. Um, Grew up gun hunting. It was a big tradition here in Michigan. But on my 20 acres, and we live on it with my 
you know, my family and everything. Um, I've kind of not fell out of love with it. I still, I still do it, but I can almost hunt my ground with a crossbow or archery during gun season and I'd be happy. You know, you think about 20 acres, how many stands do you have? Right now, I think I have four stands up and I need, I need more. Um, I'm going to do some situating. I'm, I'm basically um, in the process of changing a lot to the property. So I have hidden hinge cut, like I said earlier, along my access line. for, And I don't want deer there, but deer are just magnet right now. But I'm going to do some more hinge cutting on the interior for some bedding. So hopefully that I can take up their time on my property. It takes them a lot longer to get through my property instead of, Right now, I got a one main trail, and there it's a it's a main trail. But um, you can see on social media on my Facebook page, I'll I'll post some videos from trail cameras or some pictures, and I need to get those deer rooted to stay on my property a little bit longer, and kind of avoid my not to say I'm cutting the deer off from my neighbor, but I'm trying to I'm trying to kind of cut them off from my from from my neighbor a little bit. Um, make it more difficult to get to his bait pile or his whatever he's doing over there. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a challenge. So right now I got four or five and I need, I need some more because I only have, I have one, one acre is all I have of open ground um, where I put some food in and uh, it's a, it's a power line, overhead power line. So I let, it's in front of the house too. So it's on the front of the house, north side of the property. So I just kind of avoid that area. I don't, don't hunt it at all. And, you know, I got, my wife does hunt, but it's hard for um, her to get, get out. And so we're trying to do what we can. And uh, hopefully one of these days we'll get it figured out. Well, thanks for that. You know, it's um, amazing how we can look at a piece of property, be hanging in a piece of property and then go, Oh man, I didn't, I didn't think about that. And, you know, your neighbor with a bait pile or something like that, definitely, you know, uh, an attractant. So, you know, how do you, how do you work around that? That's, that's interesting. Hey, what's one thing you learned from last hunting season that you want to share, uh, with the, uh, with our listeners? Last hunting season, um, I, I think, and it happens almost to me every year, but, um, on those days, you know, especially if you work work a lot or work full time and, and 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 have some vacation time, and I think a lot of guys say this. A lot of a lot of the managers or the good hunters, um, the expert, more expert than I am hunting hunting the actually hunting the deer. They really look at the weather and they'll look at a lot of different things. But I did notice um, just to hunt, especially on a smaller property, the hunt the right day. Not necessarily the right wind. If your scent control is good, you you could should be able to hunt any wind. Um, but when there's a high pressure and a um, and low temps and those those lines kind of come together, get out there. And um, and another thing I, I probably should have did some more from last year is when the when the bucks are really chasing the deer or they're trying to find their mate, um, you should be out as much as you can be out there so that's a couple things um and uh one other thing is um i don't wash my clothes every time i get done but i learned this year i might change my or, or my base layer um i just use a i can't even i don't even know the brand of it uh, just an x series base layer um wash those every time out not your outer clothing just those those the ones that touch your skin. So I'm going to do that next year. Now, do you take a shower before you go out every time? No, I don't. Um, again, my my setup is not. It's in the process of building. Um, one thing I see a lot of guys doing is building a scent room. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of those before, but they they have a separate little room that they the washer and the dryer is dedicated to only hunting clothes. The, the the towel that they use only for hunting, um, scent free soap. Um, so I'm not able, I'm not in a position to take a shower every day. And uh, I'd wake my wife up, and she probably, I mean, I don't want to necessarily do that for 
I love deer hunting. I want to shoot a nice deer, but it's more important to me to keep, you know, keep her happy than me shooting a deer. So I don't want to wake her up every morning and, and stuff like that. So once I get my set out in my pole barn or, or whatever, I may do that. Um, but not every time. When I do go on an afternoon hunt, I, I, I can take a shower right before. But, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, kind of going back to extreme scent control, I'm not there yet. What type of boots do you wear? I got some muck boots, and I do dedicate those just to hunting. Um, they're the high boots, rubber. Um, I'll spray those down with some scent killer spray. I don't use a lot of scent killer spray, um, and they work fine, but I, they are dedicated just to hunting. So when I do come in, and um, you know, I put them in a tote separate, um, keep them dry, keep the insides dry. So they work pretty good. When it gets cold, uh, I use some of those thermo, them with heated thermocells I got for Christmas, and uh, those are nice. Those are real nice. You know, scent control oh, yeah. is a huge, a huge, huge, huge business. And scent crusher, you know, has their, you know, you put all your clothes in their, their bag and they get, you know, duffel bags. And, and the thing that I know about scent control is that, um, no matter what you do, if you don't approach your stand right, if you don't, uh, do some things right in your stand, it, it's, it's not going to make a difference. Now, please. Don't send me hate mail for saying that, but sometimes we get all the gear in the world, but we're not applying it right. I guess that's the correct way to say it, and I think anybody would agree to that. And if you don't do that, then what's the point? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, we can – hey, I thought, you know, I've tried different things, you know, um, scent bombs and um, I tried a bunch of different things. You know, if someone says, oh, this works. Um, right now, I think the big thing is, um, and I don't want to down anybody's products, but um, Ozonix. It's really, it's, it's really the Ozonix thing. I think they put in a tree or in their blind. Um, I don't know much about it, but a lot of the guys that have it seem to just love it and stand by it. Um, what I think is deer accept human scent. So I have an, a little bit of an advantage. Um, I can't go out and pet my deer, but my neighbor, two houses over, she feeds deer off her bird feeder. And she she can go out there. I see her feeding the deer or feeding. Maybe she's just doing her bird feeder, but they're right behind her, 10 yards. She's got her little dogs out there. and I, I can't. Those deer know my my pattern more than then I think they do. Um, they know when our house door opens and shuts. They know when we drive in and out. I've been in the back of my property hunting, and I can tell when somebody drives in the driveway. And deer are a lot better here or seer than than I am. And so um, it's it's tough. So on the scent control, they'll accept some of, some of my scent, but I don't know how much. Um, but I can have a deer walk downwind of me. I don't necessarily know if the scent is going over them or not. And then I can have 10 minutes later, have another deer do the exact same thing and look right up or, you know, notice something. And you can not necessarily get busted, but they know something. So they're smelling me or they're sensing me. Um, I'm usually high enough. I did notice if I'm at least 20 feet in the air, you can kind of fool their, their vision. Um, especially you have some structure either in front of you or around you, behind you, you can usually fool their vision as long as there's no quick movements or anything like that. But the scent thing is a, uh, it's, it's a tough deal. Yeah. It's interesting. And you see some things um, with different sprays and everything, um, you know, it, you go, what is that doing, you know, for the deer? We don't know. You know I'm not a scientist. And I don't know what's usually in it. I mean, I have an idea. I mean, you can make your own, they say. Um, so, you know, you got dirt scent or apple scent or you can jam a, a deer's nose. I've used deer jammer before and um, I got success. And then other times I haven't. So it kind of went back and forth. Could have been, it might not even been the nose jammer. It could have been totally something different. I have no idea. Um, 
So I kind of gotten away from those different things a little bit um, and just kind of finding my own. I think as long as your clothes, I, I am a believer in, in the carbon um, stuff. I use a carbon mask over my breath. And I have noticed from the years that I haven't used it and the years that I do or when I do, that's a big difference. I mean, there's a lot of scent coming out of your breath. And if I can just hold it down a little bit or, or kind of control it, I have noticed a big difference in that. Um, and I think, you know, your armpits, your feet, your head are probably the biggest things you need to cover up. And um, I wish I wish there was a, a thing you could walk by, like an x-ray machine or something on your way out and see how contaminated you are. Um, but uh, maybe someday. Maybe someday. <laughs> hey, folks, if you want to chime in, I'd, I'd certainly welcome any conversations. And, and so would Casey, uh, whitetailronavu at gmail.com. And another thing, if you really know about this uh, scent, um, you know, um, knockdown, that isn't the right word, uh, abatement, um, you know, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I, you know, reach out to me, social media or whatever, because um, it's an interesting uh, business. It's a huge business. There's great companies out there. Ozonic's a great company. Uh, um, you get the scent crusher people from scent crusher. Um, you know, and all the carbon um, gear, it's a huge business and they're doing something right. Um, but it's interesting always to have uh, conversations and see how we can make it better. You know, Casey, we're getting in the end of the show. What are three or four things that you do every single year when it's time to go archery hunting? Well, obviously, number one, I, I shoot my bow as much as I can. Um, I, I, I probably, I probably should shoot it more. Um, I've had the same equipment though, the same bow for 12 years. I've had the same, usually the same arrow rest, the same sight, um, arrows, broadheads, everything. I've used it for a very, very long time. I, I don't like changing that stuff up very much just because I like what I know. Um, so number one, I would say shooting your bow as much as possible and getting, you know, we owe it to the animals that we hunt to, to do our very best to take, number one, a, a good, clean, ethical shot and to down them or kill them as quickly as possible. Um, last thing we want is big, long tracks. And I know that happens. I think it happens to every hunter. Every hunter, it's got to happen to. Um, it's, it is very disappointing when that happens, but it, it does happen. Um, so that's number one. Number two, trail cameras. I I utilize those a lot. I have them out year round. It's a good way to try to get to know your deer herd better. Um, whether you you're using it to count the deer numbers or whatever, um, but that can be addicting. <laughs> it's really fun doing them, um, but you can overdo it. I overdo it usually, but uh, hey. It's fun. Um, so those are two num number two things. Obviously, buy your licenses and everything, and you know, stay legal. Um, and I don't know, you know, that's make sure your gear is in good good working order. Uh, most important. Well, Casey, on behalf of thousands of listeners across North America, uh, thanks for sitting down with us this morning and talking about complete complete deer management. Thank you, Bruce. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I haven't done this very much. Hopefully get into this stuff a little bit more and love to sit down with you. I mean, obviously we just touched on some subjects and, and we could talk for days on this stuff. Uh, I could anyway. This is my life, my passion. Um, I'm just going to keep getting, hopefully keep learning and passing on the information. So appreciate it, Bruce. Hey, folks, I'm really excited to head down to Kentucky and meet up with Josh. Honeycut. Now, a lot of you have already seen his byline where on Realtree.com, where he's the deer hunting editor. Yes, if you go on Realtree.com and look for Josh Honeycut, you're going to see a lot of great articles about whitetail hunting. Josh has made his name and his byline is shown throughout uh, outdoor media, uh, such as Outdoor Life, Field and Stream, and hundreds of other magazines. He's been featured in North American Whitetail. So any place you look in 
or whitetail information, Josh is going to show up. So he's going to sit with us for about an hour, and he's going to share some of his insider tips about hunting whitetails throughout the United States. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.